the day has been long and we have he heard a lot of uh, valuable information and multiple times there have been uh, mentioned one thing which is security and at the core of security of course are data and data are transferred, data are aggregated, data are uh, stored and uh, that's the topic for this discussion. The age of quantum computing is coming up and the question is how are we going to live in this era? What, what's going to be cryptography challenges? Uh, you can ask the questions online and we again have a poll there. Do you follow the latest technology news and trends with the purpose of knowing how to safely store your data? Well, that's an interesting hobby to read news about storing data. But please fill in Paul so we can see. So the topic is secure data transfer and it will be moderated by Bert Helm. Hi, Round of applause. Hi guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as my friend Ernest just said, we this talk is about data security and quantum computing. These are two phrases that typically when you mention them together, um, especially with computer scientists, uh, cybersecurity uh, executives or telecommunications executives, they get a little bit jumpy. And we're going to find out why, uh, because uh, I'm about to introduce to you five of the jumpiest um, uh, who, men who are thinking have all have stakes in the secure transfer of data or involved with the development of quantum computing. And we'll talk about why those two things are going to intersect and why it matters and what to do about it, both how to manage the risks and how to capitalize on the opportunities. Uh, directly to my left is Professor Andres Ambinas. He is a professor of computing at the University of Latvia. Um, he is one of the leading authorities on quantum information theory and quantum computing. Um, Richard Feynman, the late great physicist, once said that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. Uh, professor Ambinas understand, doesn't understand it the most, right? Something like that. Uh, and we're really lucky to have him here to be our science expert. Next to him is Evis Tauba. He is uh, on the board of this sponsor, uh, the, uh, the L, excuse me, uh, LRTVC, and he is head of its technology division, looking at things including uh, finding ways to Distribute to, to distribute quantum algorithms and key exchanges in safe ways to basically make quantum safe cryptography, and we'll hear more from him about that. Next to him is Egans Bush. Egans is the security director at LMT. He is responsible, uh, therefore, for the secure data transfer of all the data going in and out of your mobile phones um, today and always. Um, no pressure, Egans. Uh, and then uh, finally here in person is Zoys Kokonas from the European Space Agency. Uh, and he is a direct, a, a, in charge of future programs there. And one of the things they are working on is looking at quantum key distribution via satellites. Uh, one of ESA's missions is working to find ways that the satellite and space industries can support industries here on uh, the ground. And also joining us remotely from space, what, no, Luxembourg, um, is Andre Adelsbach, um, and he is the Vice President of Group Information and uh, Cybersecurity uh, at SES, which means he looks at making sure there is secure data transmitted up to their network of 70 satellites, is that correct? Um, and is also looking at how those satellites could be involved in quantum key distribution in the future. So we'll talk about that. Uh, to start it off though, I wanna kind of bring this to life for those of us who have not been, uh, have, didn't take a time to brush up on their quantum uh, logic tables today or weren't looking at their um, 
uh, various Schrodinger equations. And just let's say, let's talk about the implications of what it means when you have powerful quantum computing. And to do that, I think one kind of fun, silly hypothetical, let's imagine, this is probably not gonna happen, but tomorrow, the CEOs of Apple and Google go on stage together. They both take out an iOS phone and an Android phone, and they say, these are the new phones that each have quantum chips preloaded. They're powerful. They're cheap. They're on sale now. OK. Enjoy. Goodbye. They're unlocked. Uh, what happens, Professor Ambinus, when that happens? And, and I'm curious, when you hear, let's say you watch that press conference, what's the first call you make, and what do you say? Well, I guess the first call would be to find out how how powerful exactly are those chips. So if they are powerful enough, they would be able to break all the secret key encryption infrastructure that we have. So in that case, the next calls would probably have to be to Latvian radio and television center, uh, LMT, all the all the other major telecommunications gotcha. and data communi communications. Okay, so party. Professor Ambainas just called you both, Egans at LMT and Avis at the Latvian radio and tele television center. What, who do you call next? What does this mean that he said that all uh, of our standard encryption uh, can essentially be broken now? Go ahead, Evie. Okay, yeah, if I can start, yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so actually, in fact, uh, we got this call already like um, almost two years ago. So we got this call from the scientists. Yeah, not exactly from Andres, but uh, but 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 the others. And basically, this is this is this is all about that we are sitting here and discussing. Mm, uh, yeah, and um, there are activities, and actually, there is a good thing is that, is that there is even the EU financing for the projects to fight with this uh, two phones mm. or whatever is coming. <laughs> so basically to be ready. Yeah, and we'll it, talk about luckily that. Luckily it hasn't happened yet, so the phones are not there, but uh, but 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 um, things are... Given coming. that you got that call, what was it that helped you get back to bed that night? Because I think the situation where all of our codes are going to be decrypted in that mint or, or could be, is, is a little bit it's, scarier. It's scary, but um, we hope we still have some time. So we are acting now. Gotcha. Now, Egan's. So from security leadership point of view, well, we could compare that suddenly all doors are open in this area, all locks are open. In reality, a one thief or even a group of thieves cannot rob everybody immediately, and we probably also have another means of security. Maybe if the locks are broken, maybe we have still physical guards, we have tourniquets, procedures, etc. in place. From uh, supply chain perspective, if somebody comes with a quantum computer with enough qubits that would be immediately put on a sanctioned goods list so it cannot be freely moved around the world if it comes from the Western world. If it comes from somewhere else, we would see, but so far, well, we haven't seen like a even imaginable threat from, from outside world yet. Mm. Andre, uh, up there in outer space slash Luxembourg, uh, what what do you do when you hear that, um, when you get that call? Um, and, and what does that mean for a network of satellites? Yeah, I mean, first understanding, obviously, yeah, how powerful this, uh, the, this uh, quantum computer really is. And then, yeah, definitely giving a call to my uh, CTO, uh, telling him that we need to establish a, probably a task force um, to review the potential impacts uh, and, and also mitigations that, that uh, can, be, can be taken. Um, obviously, understanding that quantum, such a breakthrough quantum compute, computing would mostly impact public key crypto, um, it's really important to differentiate and, and make a detailed assessment uh, of the actual impact of, of such a such a breakthrough. Gotcha. Zoys, can you tell us a little bit about the European Space Agency's stakeholders and how this this question of quantum computing and the prospect of it of it so coming to life affects um, the being a little work. more skeptical, I would start with taking a step back and considering first whether this would be a hoax. Mm -hmm. Because that is not unlikely in such situations where something is announced where you want to make. Then on a personal level, I think there's 
would be straightforward. You switch all your mobile phone because it's no longer encrypted. You cannot communicate, right? And how do you communicate? You start writing. <laughs> uh, you, you go buy a pen and you write on paper and you send a letter by post. You go buy stamps and so on. This is not what we're going to do. Mm. So we need to have a strategy and we need to prepare for that. And we need to prepare before this is the case. And mm. this is, I believe, what all organizations are doing. Because implementing standards is not just an idea that you set up, but you need to have a path towards that. Even if you say this algorithm is no longer secure enough, you need to develop the next algorithm and you need to bring it out. And this does not happen in one day or two. So, as I said, my action would be okay. Well, start, start you're right. writing on, so on, on paper. Turns out it was Nothing a digital hoax. any longer. That, that's not a solution. Great. And it was a hoax. I made it up. Um, and the hoax now stops here. I'm, I'm committing hoax up a coup and admitting it. Um, but then what does that mean? I mean, I guess one of the questions that I have, and I want to just touch on this quickly because I want to spend time talking about how we prepare for the risks because it does feel like something. I mean, is this something that is going to happen eventually? What is stopping? Why is this? Why is that such an unrealistic uh, scenario, Professor Ambinas, and what does performance look like now versus what it would need to be to have the, you know, the scenario that, that Zoyce is describing of shut off your phones, start writing letters? Yeah, I guess, I guess the difference is in how long computations can quantum computers perform. So what we have is right now is what are called intermediate scale noisy quantum computers. So first, intermediate scale means that they have relatively small number of quantum bits or qubits. It's not a problem by itself because a lot of encryption infrastructure can be broken with about two to 4,000 quantum bits. And the latest device from IBM has 400. So it, we are a factor of 10 away from that. Uh, IBM promises to be at 1,000 quantum bits by year 2024, probably 4,000 by in five years. So we will have a number of the right number of quantum bits. But then the key difference is how long, for how long computations can these quantum bits perform. And here we get to the noisy part. The current devices are noisy. So what they can perform are relatively short computations. And then after this short computation, the quantum state decoheres and we can no longer get anything useful. And what we need for breaking codes is a very long computation on 2,000 quantum bits that would consist of millions or billions of steps of computation as opposed to 10 or 20 steps that we can perform right now. So there is still some time that is measured in decades. And yes, has IBM made any promises on when uh, these 4,000 bits the qubits will cohere indefinitely or at least for a manageable amount of time? Uh, I, I think they expect to have these 4,000 quantum bits in a few years. But mm. uh, the, the key here is for how long can you compute with these quantum bits before quantum state going bad? And is that is is that a, just a matter of time or is that a significant a question that we simply have not figured out yet? I think it's a matter of time, but here uh, it's not one magnitude, it's not one order of magnitude that we need to improve here. It's multiple orders of magnitude. It might be whatever, six or seven orders of magnitude, or it might be set of advances on both hardware and software side simultaneously. Gotcha. So this could be, it's, um it's a question mark, but nonetheless, the stakes are high, and it means you need to prepare ahead of time to guard against this. Now, Evie, you were telling me a little bit about some of the things that you guys have been working on to create quantum safe data transfer, uh, essentially encryption algorithms or key exchange that can uh, withstand uh, a quantum computer's best Bruce Fort best brute force efforts to decrypt it. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. 
so what we did um, actually with um, big help of Latvian University in cooperation, so we we have done some, let's say, real life test um, with uh, two quantum key distribution units. Yeah, and funny, they are called Alice and Bob. So nice black boxes and um, um, using our existing like normal fiber optics network, um, we created real life tests. So we have achieved pretty good distance, uh, which was not like a physical limit yet, but um, it was 30 plus kilometers. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun doing this test. So we first thought that it's like a normal fiber. The fiber optics is fiber optics also in Africa and Latvia, but um, it's not the case. So there were, were re really, really, really mm, not yet plug and play. Uh, since the units are using the single photons to exchange the quantum states. Yeah. So anyway, but we have done with the help of uh, university and also our engineers, and we installed the, like, let's, we can call it 100% secure channel, 34 kilometers from one side to another. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they live 34 kilometers away from each other. They start to communicate and then they kind of, if the yeah, communication they, breaks down fairly shortly after that. They agree. Sounds first, like my parents. Yeah, first first it takes few minutes to agree that uh, who is Alice, who is Bob. Then they are happy and then they settle down and then they are happy to exchange the keys. And the keys are, keys are quantum physics based. So you cannot break in, you I mean, cannot it's, read. Yeah. It's fascinating mm -hmm. that you have single photons going that distance. I mean, even that, dis that distance needs to be longer. Um, a certain point, but it's amazing that you're seeing, you can observe quantum entanglement at that distance and that you're, we're seeing it at larger differences. I think you said distances that were- Yeah, the in industry is developing. So what uh, Professor Ambani said, that's about quantum computing, but this QKD, it's a different thing. Mm. So probably part of the physics is, I don't know how big is this uh, similar, but the, but the technology is different, um, but, but, but distances are gradually improving. So now, now what we are hearing from the vendors, and vendors are not many, uh, the longest distance is somewhere 120 plus kilometers. Mm. Of course, the another story is um, uh, uh, about satellite, uh, satellite channels, that's something else, but uh, the physical fibers which are on the ground, this is now 120 plus yeah, gotcha. around that distance. And, and we'll get to the satellite discussion in a minute. I want to talk about a little more about preparing for the risks. This is, this is one way of doing, um, this is looking at getting quantum key exchange that can, uh, that isn't vulnerable to um, a quantum computing, uh, I guess I don't know if you'd call it an attack, um, but the brute force uh, attempt to decrypt it. I wanna, I'm curious about when you're preparing for this as a risk, Agons, how are you think? How are you thinking about this risk as an organization, at LMT, or just as an executive? This is not something that's happening tomorrow. Um, it does have very. It's it's a long way out. It has an uncertain um, uh, kind of time horizon, but it's significant certainly. What is that? I mean, how how do you how are you thinking about it, and how do you advise people who are also either CISOs or security directors to talk to their boards? about and their their executive team about what it will take and when it should be a priority no, that's a great question what we did last year we signed a memorandum with uh, also with latvian university and one of the latvian vendors microtic who produces actually a lot of things and like 5g routers etc in latvia so we are following up the industry we are part of it of course we do not have the academic power but therefore we team up with academia from the CISO point of view, it's about risk evaluation. If, and if we a little bit step away or sidestep, if some vulnerability is discovered in general, usually it's not within the seconds that everything is broken and dead. Usually it is vulnerabilities and some proof of concepts, and it's going to be weaponized, and it's going to be targeted on specific regions, areas, or industries. So it's not going to happen over, even not overnight. Sometimes it takes just days. Sometimes it takes more, more than well months or years. So this is general approach is to be within the community, to look after it, and also well 
my team has even the responsibility to read all the news and what's happening and to follow up so we can prepare better. And a little bit of reflection of this uh, IBM and qubits. It seems that for the pragmatic practical use in technological companies, increasing the key lengths could save us for extended period of time. Not forever, but we'll see. Gotcha. Now, Andre, you uh, manage security. One of your hats is managing security for a network of 70 satellites. It's not so simple for you uh, just pushing an update um, at this. You need to plan decades in advance because that's how long some of these satellites are up there. So how do you think about this as a as a problem for securing data that, that is being transmitted to and from your network of satellites? Yeah, de definitely. So in, in our specific case, um, so satellites have a, fortunately, a long lifetime um, of 15 plus, plus years. Um, so you really need to, uh, to, to think in advance when you want to, uh, to uh, make sure these, uh, yeah, the satellites and the infrastructure and the services are secure for the next next years of operations uh, and that's why um, there's a um, let's say after after um, a few uh, um, crypto algorithms ha had been uh, compromised uh, in the past there was the the evolving concept of uh, crypto agility which basically means that uh, you are able or your applications are able to uh, to efficiently swap out uh, underlying crypto primitives and this is really something um, we, we are working to adopt uh, more and more in our design and implementation so that uh, once we see that, that a crypto algorithm isn't any more strong enough uh, to, uh, to mitigate from, uh, from various threats, uh, that we are able to swap out the underlying crypto algorithm by another one. Obviously, this requires um, a lot of um, standardization in the application APIs. Uh, you need to inventory uh, the, the crypto algorithms you are using. So this is really a lot of effort, but uh, yeah, if you want to to ensure continuous uh, security of, uh, of our services, this is something we have to do as an organization. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that came up during our calls preparing for this was that uh, a project such as this, which requires updating and, and changing to make the kinds of key exchanges that take place quantum safe, uh, in the future is massive and full of little details. It was sort of like, in one point, I was one of us was joking that this is like the sequel to Y2K that no one asked for. Is Y2K a, a fair reference of the kind of infrastructure upgrade we need to do or, or not? Um, and I'm also in the audience, how many people were alive for Y2K? <laughs> Show of hands, everybody. <laughs> you guys, um, you guys were definitely alive. Nobody's. Um, anybody work on it? Like actually work on that? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, is that the comparison that you would draw? Is it? How do we decide? I mean, how would you characterize this change versus something like Y two K versus or something like just? the everyday post of a zero-day vulnerability or exploit that everyone in the world has to address and respond to? Who'd like to answer that? Uh, so Lewis? I would say the first big difference is that Y2K hit a very specific date. This is something that we currently don't have. So we have the time, but we don't know how much time. And we should start the activities to prepare. Then at least comparing to the, to, the, to the level of software during the time of Y2K, I would say there were two main differences. One is that there was much less standardization and commonality. There were a lot more proprietary system. The large part of systems which were vulnerable to Y2K were written in COBOL. Probably nobody knows any longer how this yeah, we language won't ask was the working. They're not raising their hands, so they won't, they won't this, say this, this was the approach and the idea, so this is why they were based. And right now, there's a lot, especially things that have to do with, uh, with cryptography and so on, they are based on, on routines which are used by everybody. They are based on open source routines which are used in common libraries, tested and verified. And that is also the approach that should be taken. Go into standardization so that you can have the wide-scale deployments, which are both widely tested and uh, reusable. 
So standardization is, I think, a key, and there are, there are activities which should be supported, which are going to what you could call post-quantum cryptography, which supports it. And there are, of course, two approaches. One is that you have algorithms which are not vulnerable to quantum computers, at least in, in, in the way that we understand it right now, because before, sure, we didn't think that the other algorithms were vulnerable. And on the other side, you can have uh, cryptography based on quantum capabilities, which is the quantum key distribution. Professor Rambinus, do you have a point of view on how straightforward, um, I guess, hardening our defenses against powerful quantum computers will be what that kind of, what, what sort of size or scale of undertaking we're talking about here? Well, it's a major upgrade of our encryption infrastructure. So, uh, as the previous speaker said, uh, a lot of that are open software, open source software components that are used uh, by everyone. The challenge is to decide what algorithm do we put in there. The challenge is to develop uh, new open source software components, and the challenge is to replace them everywhere. I think that's one of the challenges, but there is so many places where these components are used, and we have to make sure that uh, they are replaced in every one, every one, one of those places. And at the moment, the main challenge is deciding on what exactly do we want to use. Mm. There are multiple alternatives to encryption that becomes insecure. Uh, and the first uh, ones of them date back to 1970s. Some of them have been known for a long time. Gotcha. Now, Evis, do you have a point of view on this? Yeah, very important is to add, um, I like this comparison with this uh, year 2000 problem, but um, it's a bit different still because here, we are not, to, not talking about to replacing the existing uh, networks whatsoever, but uh, here this QKD, QKD provided 100% secure keys on point A, A and B. QKD meaning quantum key quantum distribution. Quantum key distribution, yeah. Uh, so basically what uh, with this technology we are able to provide like unlimited number of, unlimited number uh, of uh, unique um, synchronous keys 100% secure and these keys we can load in existing equipment whatever switches and uh, whatever we have on both ends gotcha and this is a great moment then so it's like additional layer of security so to talk about if you're thinking about fiber optic cable that can get pretty complicated pretty fast which brings us to talking about opportunities which brings us to satellites uh andre do you want to tell us a little bit about in your other hat how as we think about the opportunities that are available, um, and this is something Zoys, you will want to weigh in on too, what role will satellites play in cryptography in the future? Yeah, I think um, so. Satellites can can play an important role, specifically in quantum uh, um, key uh, exchange or distribution, uh, because. Um, they, they do not suffer from the, the, the same, let's say, distortion uh, characteristics uh, th that you find, uh, for example, uh, on, on the terrestrial uh, networks. Um, so a lot of um, the, the signal is traveling actually via uh, the vacuum or the space vacuum, uh, meaning that there's less distortion. And that's really um, one of the, the key advantages of, uh, of satellites in, in this uh, quantum key distribution meaning that they can yeah, support the key uh, distribution between um, two parties which are yeah, further apart than, uh, um, than, than what we, we can achieve with terrestrial um, systems today. So yeah, in, in all the, the risks uh, that, that come from quantum uh, uh, computing, they are definitely, as always uh, uh, in technology, there are always also opportunities uh, that, that can be leveraged and which open a complete new field of research and or even commercial opportunity. Gotcha. As always, uh, and we're going to be able to take a few questions in, in just a few minutes, so um, get those ready if, if people here in our local audience or online want to uh, ask. Uh, we'll be turning it over to you shortly. Uh, Zoys, what does the European Space Agency see as opportunities for business um, 
uh, because from stemming from quantum computing? So f uh, from the European point of view, I think one, one significant aspect is the capability that satellites have to send, let's say, quantum information at longer distance. This has to do with the fact that uh, there's no need for a repeater over longer distances, and quantum repeaters is something that we don't currently know really how to build. Uh, apart from that, I believe that there is a very strong point, and this is something that the European Commission is focusing on and Europe is focusing on. It has to do with the resiliency of the network and of the connectivity capabilities. It, space and satellites provide an alternative way and a, a network which is secure because it, is, it does not rely on the terrestrial infrastructure to the same extent. So it is something that should be there and to provide the resiliency. Whether the cryptography there is using quantum key distribution or something else, that, that is secondary. But to provide the data infrastructure, the communication infrastructure, and provide this in a resilient way, and provide this in a way which is accessible to everybody, that is the part where the satellites play a great role. So I would, let's say, get one step above from, from the quantum and address this aspect. Concretely on the quantum uh, aspects, uh, the European constellation, the European proposed constellation is explicitly focusing on integrating the European uh, quantum, quantum Internet, uh, EuroQCI initiative, and the European Space Agency having specific programs and uh, initiatives which are related to quantum. We see this as uh, something which is a uh, an extension of optical communication in space and is developed and uh, there, are, there are initiatives in, in focusing and, and facilitating the research for that. Mm. This has to do with the advantages that we will gain from quantum technology as it is evolving as gotcha. Europe. Professor Ambonis, what do you think of this, this idea of satellites being a, a leading option for quantum key distribution. Do you agree with that or do you, th what, how do you see the, uh, the applications coming to life in the world? Yeah, so satellites uh, certainly look very interesting here because uh, satellites are something that one could use to provide quantum uh, key distribution even even on a battlefield in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, so these satellite receivers are getting small enough so that they, they could be portable and one could set up uh, um, set them up in in conditions where uh, the wired communication would not exist gotcha. now, Evis, what do you have uh, thoughts on just the I think um, I think usually as with many other things the truth is somewhere in in between. Um, and here we, we can talk about definitely about redundancy. It's not about quantum, but uh, redundancy mm. uh, at all. So I think this is, this is a combination, so we must use the ground and the space in a good combination. And um, about the space satellites, what's good is that um, if you look from Ukrainian perspective, of course, question about the ground cables and um, in particular about uh, cables which are under sea. Mm. Mm, so this is a big question and uh, definitely needs additional redundancy. Like anyway, all the redundancy just adds another uh, resilience. Great. That's great. Well, so far we have uh, certainly raised more questions than we've answered and I think that's the goal right now is uh, just framing this as something to think about and watch. I imagine you in the audience have some questions too. Uh, who, uh, Ernie, would you like to take it from here? Yeah. One, two. Yes, I'm online. <clears throat> so we really do have a question, and it comes actually from the government. Considering the risks that quantum computing possess in the future, but the rel relatively early stage the technology is in at the moment, how would you specify the role of governments in ensuring data safety in the future? Investments in R&D, practical prevention measures, or something else entirely? Mm. 
lengthy like. question. Did it say who in the government or just says it's from the uh, government? It's Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development Republic of Latvia. All right. Who wants to answer? That's an important question. Yeah, I think, I think investments are in research and development are certainly something that, uh, that is important at this stage. And there will probably be more of, of other support from government that will be needed at later stages. Yeah, I can, I can add that um, usually, well, the, the, finance, the financing is the main part, but beside of the financing, there is a big, big gap uh, of the, actually, people who are doing the paperwork. And uh, this is the issue on many sides. So any European project needs like a lot of paperwork at the, before the project, after the project, in between. And uh, this is another topic, but gotcha. I think that's very important. <laughs> hey, Gans, go ahead. And, and I would add to that that public-private co uh, cooperation is very important because, well, it would be an interest for everybody, so we cooperate at the early stage, not just well run to the problem and then start to regulate something or in, invent something. So public-private is something I would put a stress on. That makes a lot of sense. And Zoys, do you have a point of view so on if, what... Um, if I would add to this, I would say that the, the government should also support through actions the the awareness of the public on these topics, because if, if you would consider what are the current security breaches, they don't necessarily have to do with breaking the code. They have, to a very large extent, uh, the, the issue is that somebody is not following the practices that should be there. So these are aspects where, where governments, I believe, can play a big role and invest in that, in, in making the public aware that they should be using the the current, the currently decided uh, cryptography or, or technology or protection measures and so on and, and follow them. Yeah. So that's the culture, working yeah. on the culture. Yeah. Are there more questions? No. Okay, well, I, I mean, that's a really, you raise a really interesting point too as I'm looking at 5G territory and thinking how we talk to the public about new technology that they don't fully understand. And as Richard Feynman said, no one understands quantum mechanics. So how we talk about this in a way that is, feels both comprehensible and also um, safe and not, uh, I don't know, one, is it, does anyone have quantum computing mind control yet? <laughs> 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 Professor Van Vitus. Um, but it, it, I guess that's the question is, is how do you see this as a, as a public policy um, question? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. In, in the context of quantum, we have not yet had the misunderstandings that have been around 5G or around, or, or around vaccines. No, well, okay, I guess there is this segment of quantum esoterics, quantum medicine, quantum, uh, quantum effect to being, being used to sell all kinds of quark remedies. But okay, that's, that's, some, that's something else. That's, that's, qu that's quantum being used for uh, marketing purposes of pseudoscience. That's right, that idea of a quantum. I think when you do have a, quantum, a phone with a quantum chip, it probably will not actually be a quantum computer, it will be um, a marketing term, and that's probably coming. <laughs> once, once it's possible, we will market it, certainly. I want to give the people in the audience a chance. Does anyone have questions uh, for these panels? Audience? Questions? Everyone is shy about the topic. Yeah. <laughs> quantum computing. It's a, ah. it's a little intimidating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the other thing I uh, am curious about is just how, how do you explain, I guess, if, if when people leave here, someone says, what did you just spend the last hour doing? Um, and they'll say, well, it was about quantum computing and encryption. And they say, well, what's that? Do you have ways that you have made this very easy to understand for your students when you say, here is what, if we just rewind for a second and say this is what is actually, why is it that quantum computers are able to break uh, codes so much faster 
on regular ones. Is there a good answer, or is that something where you just tell them to go to Wikipedia and leave you alone? Yeah, I guess uh, a short explanation is that there is some mathematical structure present in our codes, and this this structure is necessary for them to function. And and there is a way how quantum computers can detect this structure. So this structure corresponds to finding periods of certain functions, and quantum computers are able to catch those periods, which is which is something that we can't do on an ordinary computer. And it's a highly specific mathematical problem, and for that reason, it doesn't rule out existence of cryptography that is secure against quantum. What, happen, what happens is that it breaks those crypto systems that we are using now, it doesn't break every feasible crypto system in the future. Gotcha. And then the last question, because I think we have two minutes left, um, is simply how do people, what's your, what, what are your, all of your advice for how to keep tabs on this subject? It is complex, it is hard, but it also has big implications. It's also fascinating if you start to really think about uh, quantum entanglement and what photons are actually doing and how you can use that to do very sophisticated math. Anyone have any recommendations of just how you're keeping in, uh, tabs on this subject or what the audience should do? Should they keep caring about this? I think very important is to, we can call it even starting with baby steps and um, like sim uh, make uh, um, this new technology, like putting it close to production environment, and actually what we are about to start in the next couple of years is, um, is, a, is a real project. It's EU-funded. So the project goal is to secure, using QKD, the connection in between the main, most, most uh, critical data centers. We can call it like a main backbone. And then let's see how the technology will develop. So right now the mm, equipment is quite expensive, but uh, with development like with traditional computing, uh, the prices are going down, the capabilities are going up. So most likely it will happen, no question. And then we will expand. So starting with a backbone, with, uh, with baby steps, and then expand further. Maybe it will go even to the single cell phone. Cell phone. Mm. Maybe not in 20, 20 years, who knows? Davis, thank you yeah. so much. Yes, this is, it's so cool to hear about the work that's actually taking place and then what's theoretically possible and keeping tabs on this. Egon, do you yeah, I would surely say that put the quantum computing on your innovation strategy and agenda, look what's happening, have a little bit of R&D budget and be part of it. Very cool. All right. Our time is at zero. With that, I think I will hand things back over to you, Ernest, unless um, if our panelists have a burning thing they have to say, this audience, okay. Ernest, so, thank yeah, you so much. Uh, the poll data have come in. So 89% of you follow the news about uh, data safety. So adding to the list of your, re on your reading list probably is figure out what the compute, uh, quantum computing thing is. So that might be something to dig in because you are curious and uh, want to know stuff. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, sir. Thank you.